climate justice is a leaf on the tree on a branch of social justice, which is all about equanimity across the human race. Hello, thank you for checking out Earth Care. I am so excited to share this week's episode. We're about to chat with the incredible Tamara Tolls O'Loughlin. Tamara is a Juris Doctor. She has her Master's in Environmental Law and Policy. Most recently, Tamara was the North America Director at 350.org. So this is this organization, this movement, working to replace fossil fuels with renewable energy. Yeah, she's brilliant. She's inspiring. I'm so grateful to have Tamara on the show to talk about such a necessary and important conversation. She's gonna join us to talk about the connections between our climate crisis and racial injustice. Tamara told O'Loughlin, wow, thank you for being on Earth Care. It is such a pleasure to be talking to you. You're on Earth Care for such an important and crucial conversation. You know, two things we really see in the news, social media, wherever people get their news from nowadays are, uh, or climate crisis and racial injustice, but the two are so deeply connected. And that's what I'm hoping to talk to you about. So I guess we could just start there. You know, if I'm scrolling on Instagram and I see a post that says there isn't climate justice without racial justice, what is that referring to? Uh, it's usually referring to the idea that climate is a symptom of our lack of care and repair. So the idea that climate change itself is a symptom of uh, destruction, um, degradation, overuse and abuse of an extractive culture. Uh, racial inequality is another symptom of it. So when we've decided that um, it's okay to create a hierarchy out of things that are otherwise equal, we create imbalance. And so one way we're seeing that imbalance is in a continual um, disrepair of the global system, which means our air quality, water quality, resources, and how we interact in the ecosystem. That's also true for the decision that some human beings are worth less than others, and therefore the system treats them in every way as less than, provides less resourcing, uh, chronic underinvestment, and, and, and extracts violence against racialized minorities. And so these two things are a piece. And it is only our stubbornness that has kept them as separate issues that we treat differently when really, um, I always say that uh, climate justice is a leaf on the tree on a branch of social justice, which is all about equanimity across the human race. Wow, yeah. Absolutely. So if after this interview, we go, okay, we need to educate ourselves. We need to keep learning about this. What kinds of connections should we really pay attention to when we're learning about, you know, um, our climate crisis and basic human rights? So I think one of the things that we have to do is always look at who's vulnerable. This is where equity ex really is excels in a way that uh, just calling for justice doesn't because justice is much bigger. Um, calling for for diversity is not that useful because it is a side effect of looking at resources, sharing them amongst people and looking for who's harmed in any given situation. Equity brings us to a place where we have to go back and look at the entirety of the situation. And so one way that I thought about it is if I had six boats and I give three to two different communities, uh, one who is a really uh, a fan of the water, lives on the water, gets all their food and supplies, and another that seems to have no relationship to the water. And I just say, I have six boats, three for you, three for you. And I don't check to find out why a year from now, one set of boats is unused and rotting in the side of the um, pond and the others are really used because I didn't check in on the context, uh, the background, uh, the relationship to the water and land of the people who live there. I assumed because I had a thing to do that I could show up with my assumptions and not harm people. And so, but like, it's a really simple example, but when we think about it, it is not about resetting wrongs today with our lens, but thinking about the whole context that people have experienced. And often when we're confronted with this in climate situations or in discussions about infrastructure or uh, immigration and naturalization and border rights, we are often have to ask the question, are we coming up with a solution in the context that we're in? If you don't ask that question, there's no chance that you're going to do any equity work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like we see that in so many situations where it's just these like quick band-aids where it's like, what, who did you talk to to get to that decision? Um, yeah. Even when, the, right, the right thing at the wrong time could be deadly. Yeah, 100%. So if we wanted to, you know, um, if someone is new to environmental activism or maybe we're not new and we want to check in on our government, you know, write them a letter and they're like, hey, 
what are you doing over there to uh, help out with this? What kinds of things should we ask or look for within our own local governments? Amongst the things that have really been hallmarks of this conversation around climate in North America in general and globally is are we doing things locally that matter at the state level? Are we doing things at the state level that matter at the region level? Are we doing things at the region level that matter at the global level? Because there is no domestic climate policy. Like there is no singular place that by doing the right thing, no matter how much of that good thing it does, will solve the problem. We actually need everybody. So as a new person in this work or a person who's looking with a renewed lens at being involved in this work, it'd be smart to look at what's happening locally uh, and whether or not, um, let's say for example, a Green New Deal, a Global Green New Deal, it's really just jobs, infrastructure, and human health, things we pay for anyway, but with the lens that we can resource it, support it, and supply it without destroying the planet. So if you don't have local municipality or a provisional government that's really thinking about whether or not you are planning for jobs, infrastructure, and human health now and in the future that is not extractive, that's not based on extractive models, then that's a site of resistance, as Audrey Lord, um, Audrey Lord's thinking would have talked about picking your site of resistance in the identity that you already have, which is really hallmark to Kimberly Crenshaw's work on intersectionality. And so if you are looking at your life and you can find a place in it where there are folks who are you, who look like you, or who will look totally different, who are not being served, who are chronically underserved, then you have a place, you have a site of resistance where from whatever perch or privilege you have, you can be supportive in context, mostly by finding out what it is they might need. And so, and rather than substituting your own judgment. So sometimes that's mutual aid in this uh, compound crisis world we live in post pandemic, fingers crossed, we get to the post part. Um, I do think that mutual aid is another example of things that people have sprung up to do to, to fill in where the government has not done the work. And so in every place where people have been short on food or care or supplies, people have said, I am not an expert, but this is what I can do in my context. That's a really good way to approach any of these issues. You don't have to be someone who is expert at composting, who knows everything about methane regulation, who can trap every single pipeline from uh, North America to, to Mexico. Like these are things that that experts can do, but they also can't do their jobs as um, thinkers, writers, doers, politicians, elected officials, or communications folks if they don't have the cover of people who just care. So there's li quite literally a job for everyone. I had the fortune of doing uh, moderating a panel at the Anacostia Community Museum in the, for the Smithsonian uh, about a week ago, a couple days ago. And one of the women I had the incredible uh, uh, ability to interview was a woman who's a playwright in residence and she wrote and she's also a climate activist and so thinking wow. about what it means to get people to build sets that don't have leaded paint in them or don't come from unsustainable materials or things that can be reused she didn't say i don't have a big climate job i don't have um, a reduce reuse recycle background i didn't even care about chlorofluorocarbons or acid rain or any other thing or the ozone layer in the 80s. She said, I'm a playwright in residence and I can do something with what's in front of me to make the work better. And as a result of that, she can write about things that educate people and touch their hearts, but she can also provide literal um, physical implements that are doing less harm, that are reducing and mitigating the impacts of that work on our carbon footprint. That's so cool. First of all, that story alone is so cool, but that's so cool to hear you say things like there's room for everyone, really, because that's the thing about one of the many things about, you know, um, trying to sit down and just go, OK, where can I help when it comes to climate change? It's so overwhelming. So to hear you say, like, first of all, we need everyone. Second of all, there's room for everyone. It's hopeful. Um, one of the things that is uh, so frustrating is how devastatingly easy it is to for a lot of us to go well i've never seen a hurricane i've never seen a forest fire i'm that's not my problem for those of us who aren't so directly impacted by climate change what do you hope we really digest about it uh that 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 particular thing is not true climate and environment and environmental justice these are not luxury items if you eat food you are touched by the climate crisis any kind of food whether you grow it yourself 
or you buy it from somewhere. If you're engaged in any form of commerce, the, f the supply chain is impacted by climate. Uh, whether you see a forest or are ever near one, you are impacted by whether or not the natural carbon sinks we have continue to protect us from dying on a fiery gas ball. Um, one of the groups who, the, who comprise some of my favorite people on earth, uh, Chris Goosen, Cam Fenton, Amara Fasani, and uh, the good folks at 350 Canada, I really, part of why I have had some of the most fun times in my career just listening to them think about work um, <laughs> has largely been because they are often thinking about it from the perspective of people who do not have an entry point to doing this work, who did not write 20 or 30 books. They're trying to think about what matters locally, what are you feeling, if the temperature is even slightly different, if you can't grow plants in the places where you used to, if the uh, the weather and temperature and climate have changed significantly and you do any forms of labor that require that require you to work with the earth, the water, the land, any of it, you are going to be impacted by other folks' decisions. This is where it becomes really important for us to have a global view on our impacts because what is an inconvenience in North America is a death sentence in, in the global south. So the idea that it's warmer and so the winter doesn't last as long in the north is one thing to, to but if you are experiencing uh, the kind of heat that can kill you and it used to be once a year or once every hundred years or once every 500 years or once a day decade and it's now three or four times a year for an extended period that turns your seasons into a really hot long summer and in a really deathly cold winter, that is life changing for people who are vulnerable, who have disabilities, who have, um, and, and, and on that score, I'll say that even the idea of disability is not a permanent state. People, people move from being uh, able to do things to unable to do things to a state of recovery throughout their life in a life cycle and nothing makes you more vulnerable to climate change than that because people we don't make provisions for folks who do not have some ability to evade the impacts and the impacts are coming the pandemic is actually a side effect of what we fail to do on climate because the idea that the winter is shorter than it used to be the summer is longer than it used to be it means the migratory patterns of things that can harm us live longer and, and one of the things that can, that can check all of that is seasonal weather change. So thanks, climate change. You've taken that away too. Here's the thing. We could talk about this. This is not a 10-minute conversation. Sure. This unfortunately is a 10-minute interview series. Sure. But the wonderful thing about all of your work is, like you mentioned earlier, you do these panels so people can check you out on social media and follow your panels because you have so much to say and so much to teach us. Um, one, qu one question I ask towards the end of our interview series is, um, you know, why should we care? And in this case, why should we care about the connection between our climate crisis and racial injustice? Wow, the reason we should care is because the the thing that people say is that the arc of justice is long. Guess what? The arc is also really heavy and we can't do it unless everybody pitches in. There is no solution that can happen if we don't all pick up and do it. It's too much work to do. So jump into this ditch so we can get out of it and form a human chain and get out. Yeah, yeah, wow. Thank you so much for your time. It was honestly such a pleasure to meet you and talk to you and um, <laughs> Yeah, I'll be watching out for all your panels because I feel like every time I'm like, I need to watch these three times so I can properly digest everything <laughs> you said. But yeah, thank you for everything you do. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me and fantastic series.